Okay, I'm live and it's working. <laughs> I think it's working. Um, I am going to get started in just a second here. So I'm wearing a stethoscope uh, because people told me they can't tell I'm a doctor unless I wear a stethoscope. So I have my stethoscope. It has, as you can see over here, Elmo on it. Um, and the kids just kind of love that, I think. Uh, so that's why I do that. Uh, I do have to replace those stickers every so often because they get a little worn out like with cleaning and everything like that. But I usually, Elmo's kind of my go-to or somebody from Sesame Street. And I think it looks like I am in focus. Welcome to the Newborn Feeding Made Simple-er workshop. I was going to call it Newborn Feeding Made Simple, but that is unrealistic. Newborn feeding is not that easy and it's really confusing. And so I didn't want to call it newborn feeding made simple because then the, the expectation is, well, it's not going to be that difficult. And from what I have seen with our children and the thousands and thousands of patients that I've seen in my practice as a pediatrician, feeding is not that easy and it doesn't come natural for most people. And I think a lot of people have the misconception that, well, you'll just do it. Like, it'll be easy. It won't be difficult because the people that share how easy it is often have a different experience than the average bear. And so I just want people to be set up for success. So this workshop is called Newborn Feeding Made Simpler. And what I'm going to hopefully do is help give you some clarity and confidence about what feeding your newborn actually looks like so that you can focus on enjoying that time, recovering and getting some rest and feeding with a little bit more confidence. I think you're probably here because you're confused, you're overwhelmed, you're in information overload, there's so many different opinions out there, you're feeling guilt or worry about how feeding is going, or perhaps you're expecting and you are unsure how it's going to go, and there's so much information out there and so many people and so many voices and so many different things in your head trying to influence how you think and feel and how it goes, and it can add a lot of pressure to a period in time when you should be able to enjoy feeding and bonding and cuddling with this brand new baby that you have. But oftentimes we get so wrapped up in, are we doing things right? Are we doing things wrong? I'm My so-and-so is telling me to do it this way. Somebody else, my mother-in-law, the lady at the grocery store, the lady on Facebook, the whomever is telling us we have to do it this certain way. And it was so easy and why don't you just do it that way but for for us as an individual it can be a lot more challenging or there's other things that play into it that make it more challenging and so my hope with this is to take away the confusion to take away the overwhelm to take away the information overload and how do i decide who to trust and what's right um to give you a resource to give you some support and encouragement to give you confidence and clarity i see a lot of parents that come in they come in you know, after they go home from the hospital and they are exhausted. They've never been that tired in their life because they've never pulled multiple all-nighters after having you know, surgery or <laughs> delivering a baby. And they're, they're understandably tired. They're understandably frustrated and confused. And my hope with this is to take away a little bit of that so that you can enjoy that time a little bit more. Now, what we're going to cover is what to expect in the first days with feeding your baby and what the first few weeks are going to look like. We're going to talk about how to know if you're feeding your baby enough, because that's a common question I get is, is my baby feeding enough? Um, and then kind of how to handle the stress of feeding and balancing all of the competing priorities, the different voices in your head, the different interest in all of those different things. So if that sounds good, if that sounds like it would be helpful, just comment yes in all caps below so that I know that I'm on the right track and that this will be a really useful time that you're giving up to, to sit and talk th through this. And I wanted to let you know too, below, it doesn't show up very well because of my blue shirt, but if you have a question, you can text me. If you text the word newborn to 402-256-0768, then um, that's where kind of the questions come in. And you can also comment below if you'd like um, with a question as well. And I'll try and answer as many questions before we're done um, today so that, so that you get that good information and get that consistent, reliable source of information that gives you confidence and peace as we go through what should be a really exciting time. Now, as we get started, I'm going to take a drink of water, but before I do, what I would like to, you to do is comment below and share a little bit about you. I would love to know where you're watching from. I would love to know how old your child is or if you're expecting when you're due. And then a question, something that's on your mind about baby, about pregnant, the end of pregnancy, uh, about 
feeding your baby, something along those lines. Like what, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a question, but it can be a question, but it can also be just like what's on your mind, what's consuming your, your time right now. So as I get a drink, I would love to know where you're watching from, um, how old your child is or when you're due, and then whatever question or whatever is on your mind at the moment regarding this newborn, this new bundle of joy. And like I said, if you want, you can just comment below with questions. You can also text me. You can text 402-256-0768. If you put the word newborn in, then I'll know that we're, we're talking about newborn questions and we'll get it to it today. Or I'll do a follow-up video or follow-up text message or video email or something like that so that you can get that good information and, and have confidence and peace. When I do these kind of workshops, I, I am a simple guy and I try and do things in a straightforward fashion that makes sense for me and I've made these notes you can't see them but I, I just do who what where when why how because that helps me to kind of like figure out what to talk about and so we're just going to go through the who the what the when the where the why and the how and then talk about the questions that you have and and we'll pull those questions up and get audience questions as we as we go along and some of your questions might get answered that's totally fine if not we'll catch them so the who obviously is your newborn baby and right now we're kind of talking about the first days first weeks first month of feeding and i kind of just consider that the time where we're really establishing what feeding is and what it's going to look like for your family it's not to say that things don't change obviously with breast or bottle feeding your baby as baby grows because they certainly continue to change for the entire first year. But um, I'm focusing in for this discussion on those first few weeks because that's a really challenging time where not only you're tired, you just went through a major surgery or delivery, uh, but you have a lot of questions and you've got this new baby that didn't come with an instruction manual and it's a lot to, to, to handle. And so that's why we're gonna focus in on that for this discussion. And the what, I mean, there's a lot of different what's feeding your baby, but feeding is hard. And a lot of people make it out to be really easy, but I think for the vast majority of people, there's a lot of questions, there's a lot of concerns. There is a subset where it's just like supernatural and there's nothing to it. And well, we just fed them. But for the vast majority of parents, let me set the record straight and tell you that it is a little bit challenging to figure out. It is not insurmountable. It is figure outable. It's something that, you know, by two weeks, most parents, I'm talking with them and they've got a good system down. They figured things out. It's short lived, this confusion, frustration, stress, worry. Um, but, but for the vast majority of parents, there's a little bit of a learning curve to figuring this out. And it's not as natural. It's, it's like learning how to drive a car or drive a stick shift or something like that. Like it does take a little bit of work to figure out and, and perfect. Um, it's not just this natural thing that most people just do. Um, so let's talk about the when, because I think that's kind of the most interesting question when it comes to feeding baby. And we're just going to kind of go in a chronological order and hopefully that makes sense. Um, but we're going to talk about the, the chronological order of feeding your baby. So baby is born, either C-section or vaginal delivery. And usually in that first hour, they're quite awake and active. And so typically, you know, baby is born, the nurses, the doctors, everyone looks and says, okay, baby looks fine. And they just give baby right back to you, whether it's a C-section, whether it's a vaginal delivery. And then you have this kind of time where your baby is usually awake and active and just went through this huge thing. They have like the runner's high after a marathon um, where they're awake for a bit of a time. They're excited. They were just born. They just went through a marathon. And that is a good time to try putting baby to breast. If you plan on breastfeeding, great. If you plan on not breastfeeding, it's still a nice opportunity to have that cuddle bond golden hour first moments with baby. And even having baby latch for a little bit, if you don't plan on breastfeeding is fine too. Um, and I think that can be helpful. You know, the first hour and, and that early breastfeeding helps to regulate temperature, helps to regulate blood sugar, helps to regulate um, blood pressure and oxygen levels and all of those things. So we like to let babies have that time just with their parents to immediately just have the chance to connect and and cuddle and it's like a time for you to just like sit back a little bit um recover and and cuddle with this baby that you've been waiting nine months for and have just gone through this whole ordeal to to get out of you <laughs> um and so they, they're alive and awake and alert and enthusiastic for about the first hour. And then what you'll see is baby gets quite sleepy. It's like, you know, you go home from the marathon. I don't know if you've ever run a marathon. I've done half marathons. I've never even considered a full marathon. But you go home and then you're kind of zonked. And that's what baby does. And baby will then kind of hibernate for the next 24 hours. 
Um, what you'll see is you can, you know, kind of wake baby up to feed. Sometimes they'll be fussy. Sometimes they'll cluster feed. But for the first 24 hours, they're quite sleepy. And I think that's kind of nature's gift to you to say, okay, baby sleeping, you know, once you get moved up to postpartum or, you know, wherever you're going after you have been in the delivery room, then you can rest a little bit and baby can rest a little bit and we can, you know, get our wits back together. Um, and for the first 24 hours, you, you may have to wake baby up to get them to feed because it can be that they are so sleepy and zonked out and you, you try and feed them and they kind of fall asleep again. That's totally normal. I often come in, I, I get to go to the hospital to see new parents um, when they first have their baby. And when the baby is born and then I come the next morning, they uh, quickly say, oh, we've got a great baby. He's a great sleeper. He slept all night. We had to wake him up several times and he was just so sleepy. I'm like, guys, I, I hear you and I know that he's going to be a good sleeper, but I have a feeling that tonight is going to be a little bit different because after the first 24 hours, babies just really start to wake up. Parents are always worried in the first 24 hours, why don't they feed more? And then the second 24 hours, they're like, okay, baby woke up and constantly, constantly eats. Um, and so the next day when I go back to the hospital, they're like, yeah, you were right. Um, they were up a little bit last night. <laughs> we didn't get as much sleep. So um, take advantage of that. Um, sleep at the hospital when the baby sleeps because you don't have to do the dishes. You can't do your laundry, all those different things that, you know, creep in and make it difficult to just sleep when the baby sleeps when you're older than or when baby is older when you go home from the hospital at least in the hospital you can do those things and and get a little bit of rest because there's not much else to do there's not a lot of great tv um and so rest when the baby rests especially in the hospital baby will cluster feed cluster feeding is essentially um feeding that helps to bring milk in the the bottom line principle for breastfeeding is the more frequently you empty the more your milk will come in. And so that is just gonna be like the foundational principle that, that you can rely on is the more frequently we empty, the more milk will come in. So in those first few days, you don't have milk. That's totally normal. Nature designed babies to, to get by the first few days without having a steady stream of, of food and water, and that's totally normal. And so the more that baby feeds, and baby will help to bring your milk in by cluster feeding. So basically what cluster feeding is, is baby feeds frequently, empties frequently, it helps bring your milk in. And so you'll find that baby will feed for five or 10 minutes, fall asleep, and then you're like, okay, now we can get some rest. You try and swaddle baby up or you know, just hold a cuddle baby, and then five minutes later, screaming, queuing, wants to feed again. That is cluster feeding right there. It usually lasts for the first few days where they go in stretches where they you know, have that energy to cluster feed and then take a little bit more of a rest. Um, and then once your milk is in, once things are getting better, the cluster feeding tends to um, back off in frequency. Sometimes you'll see it. I, I hear from a lot of parents at one month or two months that they have periods where they cluster feed, probably just a growth spurt and, and trying to regulate mom up a little bit in the amount of milk. Um, and so that's totally normal too. And that's what cluster feeding is. Um, now, uh, let's see, your milk will come in usually on days two to four which means you're gonna be going home from the hospital before your milk is fully in, which means that baby is going to lose weight each day that you're in the hospital. When I go into the hospital to see see new parents, they're always worried because the nurse told them, my ba their, your baby was down 4% in their weight, and you're like, oh my gosh, what, wait, we're not supposed to lose weight. Baby's supposed to gain weight. And then the next day, you know, the baby's down 7% and, and you're getting really worried. Well, I talk through this with parents all the time. We 100% expect babies to lose weight each day that you're in the hospital. So first day, baby's down 3 to 5%. Second day, baby's down 7 to 9%. Third day, baby's probably approaching 10% in weight loss, especially if it's your first baby. And, and then your milk comes in and your the weight starts to improve so we start at our weight we drop down we hit our our bottom which usually for most babies is about 10 percent of their birth weight and then we start to climb back up and we don't regain our birth weight until we're about two weeks old for the vast majority uh, of of babies so you have a long time before baby's gonna be back at their birth weight and that's something that i think a lot of parents were never told and then they get really worried when their baby's down four percent when they're down seven percent when they're down nine percent and that's just totally normal so take a breath with that. And if you've heard that, or if that's helpful information, you know, comment yes below, because I think it is helpful to learn that because it can be really stressful when you're, you're being told that your baby is losing weight when like you just had the baby. And it seems like everybody is just talking about baby gaining weight, but baby's losing weight. Well, that's entirely normal and expected. So the first few days you go home from the hospital with baby, 
probably at their lowest weight, or maybe they'll drop down a little bit more the next day and then start to come up, uh, depending on how quickly you go home from the hospital. And then you're going to be feeding baby quite frequently. So we're still on the wind. We're still talking about the timing. And basically, it's around the clock for the first few days, where they'll sleep for an hour. They'll sleep for two or three hours. And then they'll be up again and want to eat again. And that, again, helps to bring your milk in. It helps to upregulate your milk supply, and it gets baby those calories so that they can start to regain their birth weight. Eventually, we'll get to the point where we can have baby eat more during the day and eat less at night. And I talk about that. I've got some videos somewhere. I can put them in the comments or something like that where I talk through um, how to get your days and nights straight. That's something that you can do by the end of the first week. Definitely by the end of the second week is have those days and nights straight. Now, it doesn't mean the baby's going to sleep all night, obviously, but we can try and concentrate feedings during the daytime and get more rest in the evening. So that kind of is the big picture of when. By two weeks, most babies will um, feed every two to three hours. They will have periods where they cluster feed. And then ideally, we can get more feedings in during the daytime and have less feedings in the evening or overnight. Once your baby is back at birth weight, so we have parents come in when the baby's two weeks old for a two-week checkup, and they've reached their birth weight or they're nearly there. It's not like a hard and fast rule. Like they don't have to be, you know, if they were 715 when they were born and they're 714 at two weeks, well, tomorrow they're going to be 715. It's, that's not a big deal in my book that, that it's not exactly at two weeks because they're, you know, nature isn't perfect. Nature doesn't follow the rules to a science. And so if, if you're close, that's totally fine. Once baby's back at birth weight, you can let baby set their alarm, set the alarm clock for the family at night. Between going home from the hospital and when the two-week checkup occurs and you get that weight information, I would say wake baby up at least every three to four hours overnight if they're sleeping. So I typically tell parents if everything's going well, if our milk is starting to come in, if if we're getting things figured out, then set your alarm at three and a half or four hours. And if baby wakes up before then, great. And if not, wake baby up. And then really during the day, try and get more feeding in so that hopefully they'll sleep longer stretches at night. Make their, make their life more Daytime things are bright and loud and noisy and we're out in the, the, the house and then evenings and overnight where it's dark, it's quiet, feed back to sleep, feed back to sleep. That's essentially how you get their days and nights straight. Okay, so we've gotten to two weeks. You can, you can let your baby set the alarm clock then after two weeks when they have made it back to their birth weight. And I find that the vast majority of, of, of parents of, of babies that are, are breastfed or formula fed can, can buy you know, four to six months have baby sleeping through the night, but we've still got overnight feedings for quite a while now. But hopefully over time, we'll see that they gradually diminish. Baby's able to feed and go right back to sleep, feed, go right back to sleep. It, it isn't as bad as the first few days. So take that to heart if you're in those first few days or coming up on those first few days. Um, know that the, the first two weeks is definitely the roughest in terms of sleep. And if that was the case for you, comment yes below so that other people see that and know, okay, that is the case. It's, it's hard to get good sleep in those first few days. Um, but it does continually get better from there. And what you can do is train baby to take more feedings during the day, sleep more at night, feed back to sleep, feed back to sleep, feed back to sleep, so that we don't have to do that all the time. And baby isn't up for hours in the, you know, 3 a.m. wanting to play Xbox. Um, <laughs> that should be a high school issue that we're facing. We don't want a, a, th a two-week-old baby at 3 a.m. awake for several hours. And that's something that we can certainly accomplish for, for babies. For breastfeeding moms, I find that the vast majority, once milk is in, once baby's gaining weight, we're uh, a month old, we're two months old, then the milk will self-regulate so that when baby starts sleeping longer stretches at night, you don't have to wake up and pump. You don't have to set your alarm and pump because I always tell parents, if you need to get up because if, if mom is breastfeeding and uncomfortable um, because of engorgement, then just wake the baby up and feed the baby because what happens is you're like, okay, baby's still sleeping. I'm just going to pump so that so that baby can have that, but I'm not going to wake baby up. And then as you're cleaning up the supplies after you know spending 20, 30 minutes pumping, then baby starts to make noise. And then you don't have milk um, because you just... Uh, you just pumped, so you have to give the baby a, the, the bottle of pumped breast milk instead. It just turns into a horrible ordeal. So overnight, I tell parents, basically, I would never pump overnight because the risk is then that baby will wake up as you're cleaning up after all of that, and you're going to be up even longer for stretches of time. So if you need to get up to feed baby, just if you need to get up to empty, feed baby, have baby be, um, you know, what helps you empty. I don't know what I'm saying. Um, 
I think that was all that I was going to say about that. I thought it, there was one more thing that was crossing my mind, but I forgot it now. Okay, so who, what, when, we did them out of order, where. So in terms of where, I mean, where to feed baby is wherever you're comfortable. We use a lot of pillows at our house to feed babies. And you might not realize the number of pillows that you need to feed a baby if you have not yet had a baby. But there's a lot of pillows and a lot of positioning that is required for the vast majority of moms that I talk to in my practice. It's not that you just like feed baby while you're walking around the house. Um, and, and people that tell you that they do that, you know, they're the exception to the rule. The majority kind of need some extra help with positioning baby just so to, to make feeding comfortable. And then you're not like you know, doing bicep curls the entire time that you're, you're feeding baby and all of that. So, so take the time to find some good places. There's plenty of like specialty pillows that you can find on Amazon that, that have great names that, um, make it easier to, to feed and to set that positioning up correctly. The where for sleep for babies is a safe sleeping environment. And I actually have a whole workshop. It's called, uh, the safe sleep workshop and or safe sleep 101. And it talks through exactly what the recommendations are currently for safe sleep practices so that you don't feel like, am I sleeping? Is my baby sleeping correctly? Or am I doing something wrong? And I don't even know what I want my baby to sleep safely. But how do I do that? The the, the main tenets of that, I'll, I'll post the link below so that you can watch that if you please. But the safe sleep um, is on their back and baby should always sleep on his back. If you, people tell me, you know, their, their baby rolls to their side or something like that, that's fine. You put your baby down on their back. You put them down flat. So there's no incline needed. It doesn't need to be like this. It doesn't need to be like this. I mean, one of these, depending on which way the head is, would be pretty uncomfortable. Flat, flat is easiest, flat is best. Even if your baby spits up, flat on their back to sleep. Bottom line, only line. Um, and then alone. So we don't co-sleep with baby. There's there's certainly like things that you can do safely with baby. The ones that I like are typically the ones that kind of abut up against the, the bed. So like a, I don't remember the, the name for them now, but not in bed with you. And the reason for that is fourfold. And I can, I, well, maybe threefold, I don't know. Um, one is that you could roll over on baby and you're so tired and exhausted that there's the risk of that. Two would be that baby can roll or slide down and, and get stuck in between a pillow, between the headboard, all of these places that you don't think that a baby could squirm to, but they can still move, especially if parents are moving in the bed, then baby can get jostled around a little bit and move and then have difficulty keeping their airway open. Um, Actually, ba the, another reason would be that the parents' beds are softer than baby's crib or bassinet. If you've noticed, like their theirs are not very wielding. They're they're pretty hard, and what that does is it protects baby from kind of sinking down. And then as they if if baby's head sinks down, I don't think I have a good baby example. Okay, this lens is going to be a baby's baby's head. Well, soft mattress baby's head kind of sinks down in here, and you get this little pool, and carbon dioxide can actually build up around baby because there's a little pool of area around um, baby's head where the ventilation isn't as good. And so carbon dioxide can pool there. It can make it difficult to breathe. It can suppress their respiratory effort. So you want baby on a flat, firm surface, not in your bed with you. Um, and then so flat on their back, flat and alone are the best ways to sleep baby. And don't have pillows, bumpers, um, blankets other than if you swaddle baby in a swaddling blanket that's fine but not other blankets they don't need those to stay warm or anything like that and so that would be the where and I kind of went off on a tangent but but I do think that is important to talk about and if you want more information I do have a safe sleep workshop um, that's free and quick and on demand and you can just click and watch that um, okay, so who, what, where, when, and then why? Obviously, your baby needs calories to grow and thrive and continue to develop, and that's why we feed babies. I mean, that's kind of self-explanatory. The um, why is also, you know, that it's a chance to bond with your baby. Whether you're doing breastfeeding, whether you're doing bottle feeding, or a combination of the two, it's a chance to cuddle and bond with your baby. We're always really reluctant when we get to 12 months of age and we do more bottles at that age, typically just with the way that feeding goes for our family. It's always kind of a bummer to give up that like chance to feed your baby and just be like, okay, now you just eat chicken nuggets like all the other kids. So... <laughs> We always hold on to that as, a, as just kind of like a bonding moment with baby. So that's another why. And then the how. The how is the biggest question that parents stress out about. Um, do we breastfeed? Do we bottle feed? Do we bottle with breast milk? Do we bottle with formula? Um, 
And I try and eliminate as much of the stress, worry, guilt, shame that goes along with the how of feeding baby because whatever you choose will be fine for your baby and it will be fine for you. I talk with a lot of parents that are really struggling or feeling a lot of guilt about the way that feeding has gone. It hasn't gone as they expected. It wasn't easy as they expected. Their milk didn't come in. Their latch was difficult. They tried and tried and tried and they feel like a failure. And I really try and correct that mis feeling of like a failure like you did what you could baby did what they could and this is just the next chapter for feeding baby and i really try and redirect it when when parents are getting stressed out or frustrated that however you choose to be feed baby is going to be just fine there's also a lot to be said for a well-rested and happy mother and a well-rested and happy father and when i say well-rested i don't mean like a full night's sleep like you did before baby arrived i just mean like some sleep um without that stress as a as a way to help baby because babies sense stress babies sense those things and it affects your health it affects baby's health and so please 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 try not to beat yourself up if things aren't going as expected talk with your pediatrician get support from lactation people get support from family and friends that you know are going to be affirming and to build you up and and avoid those people that say well just do this or just do that or just why don't you just do this it's not that hard i just did it blah 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 those that is not helpful messaging the helpful messaging is it's just fine however you end up feeding baby and it is a journey that parents go on and i can tell you from the experience um, that we have had and that thousands of my patients have had that it is a lot more challenging but if we can get over i'm a failure because breastfeeding didn't work out exactly as i planned then it goes much easier and i would honestly as if you're expectant and, and kind of trying to figure this out i would take the stance of optimistic, curious, wanting to learn more, okay with going with the flow. And if you can adopt that mindset rather than I have to breastfeed, everything is tied to breastfeeding, then you will be much better off and much better prepared and surround yourself with people that affirm you in that rather than say you have to do it this way or it's so easy, it's so natural, all those things. Because oftentimes it makes it a lot more difficult when it doesn't go as expected. And it is really hard. And I see a lot of parents that are that really beat themselves up about it. So that would be the 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 how is however you decide to do it. If you do exclusive breastfeeding for the first month, six months, 12 months, 24 months, whatever, perfect. If you do exclusive formula feeding for the first month, two months, four months, six months, 12 months, perfectly fine. I don't consider that like second best or anything like that. I just consider that as a different choice that you're making for your family um, and, and bully to you, which I think means good. I don't know what bully means. Um, but but it's totally fine to do that too. And anywhere in between, exclusive pumping would be fine. Half and half, not like coffee half and half. Don't, don't feed your baby that. Um, but you know, half bottle feeding, half breast feeding, half formula feeding, half, half breast milk feeding. The bottom line is it's all good. Just do what works for you and for your family and continue to adjust as you need so that you can maintain your sanity, get a little bit of rest, take care of your own mental health and wellness needs, and take care of your baby um, and feel okay about that. But find, find people that can support you in that too because that can be really challenging and hopefully that's a helpful message to share. Now, before we move on to talking about is my baby getting enough, which is kind of one of the things that I wanted to touch on because that's often a frequent question. I would love to hear from you what questions that you're having right now or how this is helping or hindering your peace of mind about feeding baby while I get a drink and switch my notes. I need like a, a Jeopardy theme song as I change this. So these, I'm going to just take you behind the curtain for a second <laughs> Sure, I stole it. This is a um, clipboard that we have at our house and these are my notes and um, I'm just going to, I, I wrote these at breakfast over breakfast about 30 minutes ago. So you can tell how, like I, I kind of had it all in my head and if I do it too early, then I think up new things. So I just kind of have a general outline of what I'm going to say, if you can't tell, and then, <laughs> then go from there and then just snap all of these guys. And there's the rest of the notes and apologies for the big orange thing and perfect. Okay, so we're going to talk about one more thing and then we'll answer some questions and go from there. <clears throat> okay. 
Thank you. A lot of parents come into my office and they wonder, is my baby getting enough? They've, they've started feeding baby and they're unsure because as I've talked about on other videos, it's often that baby has lost weight and you have that kind of trauma behind, oh my gosh, my baby lost weight and nobody told me that was gonna happen. And then we learn that it's normal to lose weight and it's normal to lose weight for the first three to four days, drop down about 10% of birth weight and then takes two weeks to come back up. And, and we've learned that that's the case and we know that that's the case, but how do I know if my baby is actually getting enough? And if that's a question that you've come up against, um, comment yes below because I think it would be helpful to, to see that, okay, that's a common concern that parents face is, am I feeding my baby enough or do I need to do something different? Do I need to feed them more? Do I need to supplement all of those things? So I'm going to walk through kind of chronologically what to expect in terms of, is my baby getting enough? Baby's firstborn. Baby's lose weight for the first three to four days. Your milk is not in, baby is well adapted for that. That is a nature thing that they get, that nature takes care of, giving baby enough fluid so the baby doesn't become dehydrated, giving enough um, fat and calories that we don't have to worry about blood sugars in term babies. Um, all of those things are, are taken care of. And so what we know is that over the first few days, baby will start to take more and more, but start at essentially zero feedings, which is, is totally normal. And as I've talked about on other videos, oftentimes babies will be awake for the first hour and then be super sleepy after that, and then will not eat well for the first 24 hours. Parents think that they're just the greatest baby because they sleep all the time and they slept overnight. Uh, and then the next day I come into the hospital and they're like, oh yeah, you were right. They are waking up quite a bit. So um, that's entirely normal. In terms of frequency of feedings, I would say most babies uh, in the first two to four days will feed every one to three hours, and that's kind of around the clock. We can figure out how to make it better in the coming days and weeks um, in, in terms of daytime feeding, nighttime feeding, but that's how it goes the first few days. Now, parents often wonder how many wet diapers and how many poopy diapers baby should have, and if that is an indicator of is your baby getting enough. And parents always expect a lot of diaper. I mean, you get diapers in like the 200 pack, right? So they must go through them a lot, and they will. But in the first few days, it's definitely not as frequent. I tell parents, easy rule of thumb to remember is the number of wet diapers should be the days old that baby is. So in the first 24 hours, I would expect one wet diaper. In the second 24 hours, so when they're two days old, I would expect two wet diapers and then three and then four and then quickly it's like 80, <laughs> it feels like 80 wet diapers per day. But that helps to reset everyone's expectations of the frequency of changing diapers and the frequency of peeing and parents worry that they're not getting enough or they need to supplement because baby's not peeing. Well, that's pretty normal. And when you're in the hospital, all the focus is on the wet diapers and the dirty diapers and you gotta chart it and write it out into the table and the nurses and everyone are asking you how frequently and everything like that. It makes it feel like a really big deal. And why, why don't I have more boxes filled out? Well, it's normal because baby has just been born. First 24 hours, one wet diaper. Second 24 hours, two wet diapers. Third 24 hours, three wet diapers and so on from there. Poopy diapers, most babies poop in the first 24 to 48 hours. Actually, pretty much all babies poop in the first 48 hours. Um, and it's like this thick, dark, starry stuff. I won't get into more detail than that because you'll get to experience that if you haven't already. Um, and that's kind of the poop that was slowly working its way through the digestive system during baby's time in the womb. And then as milk starts to come in, as they start to get more volume, the pooping frequency will pick up as it kind of works its way through the system. But it, again, takes a couple of days to totally get to the poop that you'd expect when you buy a 200, 300, 400 box <laughs> of diapers. And so most babies will poop once or twice in the first 24 hours, two to four times in the second, or no, sorry. Most babies will poop once or twice in the first 24 hours, and then once or twice in the next couple of days, and then slowly but surely by day three or four, they'll start to have more poops. They'll start to transition from black and tarry to yellow and seedy. And basically everyone's like, well, what does seedy mean? It's like if you took like mustard seeds and sprinkled them in baby poop is kind of what it typically looks like. And that's kind of yellow and seedy, but it's usually day four to five when milk is in, when we're taking a lot more volume, that we start to see that kind of yellow, typical looking baby poop. So it takes a few days to get there. So hopefully that helps to just feel more comfortable with the number of wet diapers and the number of dirty diapers. 
in terms of, and, and, and that is a decent indicator of is my baby getting enough, just that they're, they're tracking along those things. Now, as I said, babies lose weight. And so really the way that we say is baby getting enough is by watching their weight. And we would expect that by day three to four, they've reached the, their low. So all babies start at their birth weight. They drop down over the first three to four days. They hit their bottom of whatever, how much weight they're gonna lose. Usually it's between nine and 11%. And then they start to climb back up. And so we watch their weight to say, okay, Obviously, yesterday we weighed them and they were down 10%. Today we weigh them and they're down 9%, which means they're gaining weight, which is exactly what we would expect. So frequent weighing is probably the easiest and best way to know if we're getting enough rather than the number of feeds or those sorts of things because it can be difficult to know my baby, do I count this feed? Do they have to feed every hour, every two hours or anything like that? It's just nice to be able to look at weights, which is why when parents go home from the hospital, I have them come in the next day so that we can, you know, start to chart the progress and see, okay, is my baby getting enough? Well, they didn't lose any more weight. They're at their bottom weight, which was what they went home from yesterday. So I think they're getting enough because they didn't lose any more weight. And then we'll see in another day or two, they're going back up. Perfect. That's exactly what we would expect. So baby will feed frequently in those first few days once milk comes in. And as milk starts to come in, we're talking every one to two to three hours, maybe a little bit longer at night if you can get them to go a little bit longer stretch. And that helps to bring your milk in more so. In terms of the volume of feeding in the first few days, um, what we typically see is that babies will frequently eat. Sorry, I just totally lost my train of thought. Eat frequently and gain about, okay, so once milk, sorry, <laughs> totally lost my train of thought. Um, they'll feed frequently, they will start to gain weight by day four to five, and then they'll be back at their birth weight by two weeks. And I can't believe I did that thing on camera. I feel silly. Um, by two weeks, they'll be back at their birth weight and then they'll be feeding less frequently. So typically by two weeks, we're talking every two to three hours for feeds, hopefully a little bit longer stretch at night. We can get days and nights worked out and all of that, but that's kind of what to expect in terms of, is my baby getting enough? Most babies that are bottle fed will take a, around a half an ounce to an ounce per hour. So we're talking anywhere from 18 to 26 ounces per day. Now, not in the first couple of days, they'll take less than because their their system is still warming up and everything like that. But I typically think around an ounce an hour is a good measure. You don't have to feed them every hour, but a newborn, brand new baby will take anywhere from half an ounce to an ounce and a half. A five day old baby, if we're doing volume, will take anywhere from half an ounce to an ounce and a half every two to three hours. And, and then about an ounce an hour. So if you're feeding a baby every two hours, maybe they'll take two ounces. I find that most babies don't take quite two ounces at the in the first week, but then they go up from there. And again, rather than focusing on the specific volume or focusing on a specific number that you have to get for your baby, the what I would do is just look at their weight and trend their weight. And the, the reason that that helps is because if I'm telling you that your five pound baby that's term but is on the smaller side needs an ounce every hour. Well, that's a lot of ounces per body weight versus the nine pound baby that we're also saying needs an 24 ounces in 24 hours. Well, there's a big difference in their, their caloric needs and their volume needs between those. So I don't like those hard and fast rules that say you have to do a specific number of feeds per hour to be okay. That just doesn't seem to help me to um, help parents and then parents get really fixated on the numbers. So instead we watch their weight and then we say, okay, it looks like baby's gaining weight. We're gonna give you a little time here to just take baby's cues and we'll see you back at the two week checkup and we'll check again. If you need to come in more frequently than that, if you wanna stop by and get your weight done, perfectly fine. But we know that once babies are on that trajectory and parents are feeling good about it, that 99.8% of babies just continue to grow and thrive. So hopefully that helps and makes sense. If that does, comment yes below. If that gives you a little bit of peace of mind in terms of, is my baby getting enough? I would love it if you would share this video or like this video at least so that other people can see that and give them a little bit of peace of mind going forward. Now I'm gonna grab a drink and then we're gonna do some quick questions the, the reason that I got all distracted because I looked at the clock and I was like, wow, I've been speaking for a long time. <clears throat> okay. So now we're going to answer some user, user questions, parent questions. 
Okay, does, so first question that came in, does more ounces equal more sleep? To some degree, it does. It typically does mean that if you give your baby more ounces, then they will sleep more. So what that means is if you can focus on getting more ounces or at least more feedings in during the daytime, then typically baby will sleep for longer stretches in the evening and overnight. Um, it's it's not a hard and fast rule, but uh, a lot of parents like to do kind of an extra feeding right before bed or a dream feeding or see if you can sneak in an extra ounce or two and get a little bit longer stretch of sleep. And typically that does work for, for most parents. You don't have to do that, but if you want a little bit more sleep, um, I would try getting a little bit extra feeding in in the evening so that baby gives you a little bit longer stretch of sleep. Okay, is the one ounce per hour, hour a rule until they're done bottle feeding? No. And I often talk with parents about this one ounce per hour rule and how it makes them feel like they're terrible parents because their baby only took 22 instead of 24 ounces, or they're like trying to, you know, squeeze the bottle a little bit to get a little bit extra milk in their baby. Um, the amount of feeding that your baby needs depends on your baby and the specifics of their weight, of their size, of their current growth rate, and of their metabolism. There's a lot of different things that play into how many ounces baby needs. I would focus on baby cues and weight checks as frequently as you need them to feel comfortable with where you're at rather than focusing on a specific number. The numbers add to stress because, well, my baby only was, I was told they had to take 24 ounces and they only took 22. Am I doing something wrong? Is, my, is something wrong with my baby? No, maybe they're just not hungry. Maybe they aren't having a rapid period of growth and so they're not queuing as frequently to, to grow. And so I never focus on the number. I focus on are they satisfied between feedings and are they growing? And if they're doing those two things, then we're at the right number of ounces. And if you find that baby is finishing off every bottle and still seems ravenously hungry, and I was told they're supposed to take this many ounces and they're, they're asking for more, well then give the baby more because they're just telling you that they're hungry. So that's how I would approach that specific question. Uh, Okay, the next question, when do breastfed babies start sleeping in longer spurts at night? The vast majority of babies will wake up breast or bottle fed every two to three hours overnight in the first month and then gradually increase from there. And that is totally fine and expected. Now, breastfed babies and bottle fed babies can both be trained a little bit to sleep for longer stretches. I don't think that crying out or anything along those lines. There isn't sleep training that you can do or would I would recommend doing in the first two to four months even. Um, and certainly not in, in younger babies than that. It just doesn't work and cry it out is certainly not appropriate and okay at, at that age because if they're, they're crying and they're hungry, then they just need to be fed. But what you can do is you could try and focus on getting days and nights straight so that during the daytime they take, you know, 70% of their feedings, and then overnight they only need 30% of their feedings. There's certainly strategies you can do, and I have some videos that I've done on how to get days and nights straight um, that I can post in the comments below or just search around and you'll find videos that I've done on that to get your days and nights straight so that babies will go for longer stretches of sleep even you know in the first two to four weeks when you get those days and nights straight so that they know, okay, it's bright out, it's loud, gosh, everybody's moving around and doing all sorts of things. My sibling, if I have one, is really banging a lot of pots and pans around, or they, they keep the radio on and the windows open and all those things. Gosh, I must be being told that I should eat more during the day. Okay, recommendations for a fussy baby after every feeding. A couple different things come to mind when I think about fussy baby after every feeding. I assume this baby calms down after a while and isn't typically fussy for long periods of time. Sometimes it's burping. Some babies burp. Some babies don't burp. You don't have to wait for a burp forever. If baby won't burp, then just put baby down um, or go about, you know, whatever you're going to do next rather than like spending 30 minutes trying to get a burp out of a baby because some babies just don't burp, especially breastfed babies. Oftentimes they don't have a burp. Um, sometimes babies will be over distended, especially if you have a large milk supply in terms of either if you're bottle feeding and they're taking too many ounces or if you're breastfeeding if you have a fast letdown if you have a really strong supply baby might just be overly fed and that can cause distension just like at thanksgiving when you eat too much and it hurts your stomach and, and distends your stomach so you might look and see is my supply too strong am i feeding baby too much do i need to do more frequent shorter or smaller feedings that can certainly cause fussiness too 
Also, if, in, if oversupply is an issue, sometimes what can happen is you'll keep giving baby a lot of fore milk because you're oversupplied and baby doesn't get all the way through the milk before they run out of volume and size and get tired and fall asleep. They get a lot more fore milk. Fore milk has more lactose in it. That lactose, um, they're not lactose deficient, but eventually it will overwhelm the system. And so they'll have kind of a lacto relative lactose overload, which then can cause that fussiness, that... Um, gassiness, that bloating, that uncomfortableness. And so that's something to certainly talk through with a lactation consultant or your pediatrician um, because there's great strategies that we can do to tone down the milk supply so that you don't have that oversupply issue that's causing baby to get a lot of lactose, that's causing that fussiness or um, inability to soothe or comfort because they're just in, they just feel like, you know, they're lactose intolerant and they just ate a gallon of ice cream or something like that and it doesn't feel very comfortable. Um, so that, that can certainly be a thing as well. Uh, some babies will have reflux. I find fewer and fewer babies have reflux than I ever imagined from, from what I had seen previously that most of the time that reflux is not an issue. I can tell you if you took all the fussy babies that come in and see me for their well checks and for a special sick visit because of a fussy baby, I would say less than 5% have actual acid reflux that need a medicine for it. It's the vast majority of the time that's not the case. And so I am very infrequent to prescribe acid suppression and I th unless I think there's a really good chance that it's going to help because for the vast majority of babies, it's not necessary. It's not a dangerous medicine. There's some thought that and some studies that have shown that um, acid suppression can lead to food allergies, which is why I just try and avoid it, but I try and avoid it anyways. Uh, and so if you're concerned about that, talk with your doctor. But for me, at least in my practice, the vast majority of babies don't need acid suppression in order to not be fussy and spit up and those sorts of things. Oops. When should I start weaning middle of the night feeds? So most babies by um, four to six months can feed once per night. Um, most babies by six to nine months can feed zero times per night. So I would just kind of work on that. The most important thing before you start doing any sort of um, weaning of feeds is to get baby good at falling asleep on their own. And so once you feel comfortable with baby can fall asleep on his own, then oftentimes you don't even have to wean because he wakes up in the middle of the night. He is used to falling asleep on his own. He knows where he fell asleep because he's still in his crib or bassinet. He'll go back to sleep on his own. And then you really don't have to try and like wean them off overnight feedings um, because they just do it on their own. But I would say by six to nine months old, most every baby can sleep through the night. And by nine months old, every baby can definitely sleep through the night if they're growing and developing and everything like that on track. Um, and so that would, that would be kind of my, my thoughts on when to wean middle of the night feeds. I would just start with a good bedtime routine and working on going to sleep without being fed, rocked, or cuddled to sleep, and the rest will take care of itself. Oops. Oh, did you do, did you do a talk on the baby food metals thing? Yes. I have recorded a video on that and I will put the link below. I am I have an upcoming training um, workshop like this one on starting purees and solid foods and I go into great depth there and talk a lot about it. The bottom line is it's not something that you need to worry about. All food contains metals if it came from the ground. Um, it, like food that's grown in the ground contains metals. And so the bottom line is it's not something that you need to fret about and it's better to just provide a variety and diversity of, of foods for baby. But I have a whole training on that. So check the links in the notes or look around for a starting purees and solid foods workshop and you'll find all that information. Uh, and then another question, eight week old exclusively breastfed will not take a bottle at all. Did great on them until six weeks and now refuses all of them and gags on every bottle and nipple that we try. So feeding babies by bottle can be a challenge. I think in general, the best thing to do is for most babies to say, okay, we're going to feed um, baby a bottle a day around four to six weeks so that we can get the idea and practice. If you want to do it sooner than that, that's fine. And especially if latch is going well, then you can integrate bottles whenever you want. You can integrate pacifiers whenever you want. But for the vast majority of babies, I'd say between four and eight weeks of life is a good time to introduce the bottle. If you're planning on going back to work, if you're planning on somebody else feeding baby on a regular basis, introducing that bottle. There is a million different bottles out there. There are a million different 
nipples and everything like that, I would just pick one and kind of stick with it and keep practicing. Sometimes baby will not like the speed. Maybe it's too fast or maybe it's too slow. So you can play around with that. Sometimes baby will just like breastfeeding. And so sometimes what you can do is as baby is breastfeeding, you can get a bottle ready. I mean, you're going to have to have a helper for this or at least prepare in advance. Um, but what you can do is you can switch from breastfeeding to bottle feeding and see if baby will keep going once they're a little bit soothed and comforted. Sometimes the babies are very fin finicky when it comes to breast and bottle feeding at times. And so kind of trying to get them into a more lull, into a more peaceful setting than when they're ravenously hungry makes it easier to switch either way. If you're having trouble with breastfeeding or getting them from bottle to breast or breast to bottle, Start them on whatever they like and then switch them over gradually. That would be my advice. And just stick with it and keep offering. Sometimes they go through spells where they do that, though. Now, I'm out of time because I have uh, another video interview to record that I'm really excited about. But before I go, I wanted to tell you about something that I think will benefit you. If you're a person that has watched this, if you have benefited from it, if you feel like, okay, this makes sense, <sighs> It helps give me a little peace and comfort in knowing that um, I know what to do when it comes to feeding my baby a little bit better now. If that has been helpful to you, then I put together something that I think you might benefit from. It's called Brand New Baby. It's a course for parents in the first eight weeks of parenthood. It starts with what does it look like going to the hospital? It goes through the first nights in the hospital. It goes through going home from the hospital. It goes through weeks one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's a video for each week that basically breaks down exactly what is covered um, in the office when I talk to parents and also all of the questions that they come up with because I have gotten a pretty good sense after seeing thousands and thousands of parents what the typical questions are. So when you're at the hospital with your brand new baby, I'm not going to tell you about baby acne. I'm going to tell you about baby acne when they're three weeks old because when they're four weeks old, you're going to go into the office and you're going to say, what's up with my baby? baby's baby acne? What am I going to do? So we talk about baby acne. We talk about swaddling. We talk about how to tell, is my baby sick? We talk about how to get more sleep, how to feed baby, pacifiers, um, jaundice. We talk about all those different things. It's a it's a nice way for parents to get that information and, and feel comfortable going in knowing, okay, we just got home from the hospital. I'm going to watch this week one video. Or it's week four, and I don't remember what he said about baby acne. I'm going to go back and watch the week three video because I know he talks about it there. And it's just all laid out in such a nice way. It's been something that was really fun for me to put together. And I always you know, give it to my parent, new, new babies, when they come into the office. And they're like, oh my gosh, it's like you were in our house answering the questions that we had. And you're in my head you know, telling me about when baby's going to sleep longer and how to get their days and nights straight and all those things. We talk through all those things. It's called Brand New Baby. If you go to brandnewbaby.co or just click the link below, then you can join and get that information that you need. It gives you confidence. It gives you peace. It gives you clarity so that it's one less thing on your plate as you're going through new baby world. You have a resource that you can trust. You don't have to Google everything. It gives you the information. It, it complements what your pediatrician is giving you and just kind of fills in those gaps of things that I always forget to talk about that, you know, oh yeah, your baby's going to hiccup a lot. That's totally normal. I forgot to tell you that, so you called. Well, instead, I got this video that I'm going to have you watch about baby hiccuping and sneezing and baby's breathing so that you feel more comfortable with that. So that's what Brand New Baby is. It's a really short course. It's a couple of bucks. It's brandnewbaby.co, and I would love for you to join us and, and get that good information if that's something that you feel like would be of help to you. This has been really fun. Thank you for all the questions. I'll get to more questions um, in the, the comments and in the coming days, but keep up the good work. And if you're getting ready to have a new baby, congratulations. If you have a new baby, congratulations. Super exciting and it's a super fun period of time. And I just love getting to see parents in that first stretch of days when, when they have their brand new baby and they're not sure what to do, but they're really excited and really nervous and really uh, unsure. But helping them through that is my favorite part of my job. Keep up the good work and have a good day.